or how would they see this themselves as totally different people? Well, um, I think uh, they normally see themselves in terms of heritage. You have to understand that uh, these people were already independent uh, nations, kind of. Okay. living in, in particular areas. It's only the arrival of, uh, in, in the new arrival of uh, a wave of Arab traders in particular that maybe has led to the intermarriage or uh, has led to this, uh, the, 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 the expansion of the lingua franca. Welcome to the African Experience Podcast, your podcast for fascinating discussions, stories, and interviews from the diaspora. Your host, Two Ordinary Africans. Hello, fellas, and welcome to today's episode of the African Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Abdul Hafiz. Here at the African Experience Podcast, we are dedicated to bringing you fascinating discussions on a wide variety of topics pertaining the continent and its diaspora. And today's episode is no less. We will be discussing a culture, a group, an ethnicity, a people, a language... <laughs> And I think they're probably one of, if not the most diverse set of people on the continent. They are situated mostly mid to eastern part and majority on the coastal part of the continent. So to have this discussion and conversation and to tell us more about these people, I am delighted to introduce you to my friend from Kenya, Ibrahim Mukhtar. Hey Ibrahim, sup, how are you? How are you doing? Hello Abdul Hafid. Thank you brother for hosting me today. It's an honor. Uh, this is my first uh, ever podcast. So I think uh, uh, we're making history. <laughs> yes, we're making history. So uh, Ibrahim, uh, can you tell me about yourself, what you do? Um, your background, basically? Well, uh, my name is uh, Ibrahim Mukhtar. Uh, I'm currently in Ankara over the past uh, almost five years. I've completed my master's here in international security. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm currently doing my PhD in uh, international relations. I'm about to start working on my thesis. Okay. My bachelor's or undergraduate program was in, I did it in Nairobi, in University of Nairobi. Okay. It was on sociology and uh, conflict and peace studies. Yeah, I'm, I was born in Kenya, in Mombasa, uh, yeah. the coastal part of, uh, of uh, Kenya. It's the second uh, biggest city in the, in the country. And uh, yeah, over the past few years, I've been moving in some parts of Africa, been to Djibouti, to Somalia, to Ethiopia, and then to Turkey. Uh, the journey continues. The journey continues, certainly. I agree. The journey never ends, right? Yeah, it's life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ibrahim, uh, th- this specific part of Africa, right, to me is one of the most fascinating things about Africa. Because um, as a person from West Africa, we have, compared to the eastern part of Africa, I'd say um, we are more or less diverse, if that's a term, compared to eastern Africa. It was always fascinating to me. So I wanted to know more about eastern Africa, the coastal part, and especially the Swahili coastal part. So can you give us, say, a brief history? Can you give us a brief history about this part of Africa? Uh, Sure. Um, 
I'm not a historian, but I've uh, been in the region. I've read quite a lot um, uh, as part of my studies as a student of international relations and also as a student of uh, sociology. Mm-hmm. And I've also interacted with the old school who've also shared their experiences. And some of the things are things I've observed, I've uh, analyzed uh, throughout uh, my time growing in the in the region. So basically, or geographically, when you talk about uh, East Africa, uh, it's a very wide region, uh, mainly narrowed to describe uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and uh, Uganda. And uh, uh, these can, these three countries can can be said to be the core of East Africa. They're always there. Okay. And then we call, we talk about sometimes the Eastern Africa. Now, it's a little bit different. When you talk about the Eastern Africa, it goes on to extend uh, to include uh, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Mozambique, uh, Malawi, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan. Um, it, it continues. And sometimes uh, there are overlaps. When you talk about Horn of Africa, you find yourself more into the Eastern part of the Horn. Where oh, yeah. Somalia, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, South Sudan, and to some extent Kenya. And uh, so the, the, the definition is actually uh, not constant. And for that reason, uh, whenever a, a scholar is writing about the region, he has to specify his borders. Mm. Okay. Uh, but as I told you, if you want to talk about East Africa, uh, that right now we have what you call the East the East Africa community. It's just like a small uh, kind of uh, uh, course, you know, and, yeah. uh, and aimed at integration and you know trade and stuff. And this is mainly uh, at the moment it's uh, it's between Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, and uh, Uganda, and uh, I think also South Sudan, if I'm not wrong. So basically, these, uh, in terms of geographically, these are, uh, this is what we call the, 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 the East Africa. Now, when you talk about the coastal part, the coastal part is very important because it, its history is very rich. Uh, over the years, it has uh, witnessed uh, the interaction of uh, uh, major ancient world civilizations, uh, be it the Arab, the European, uh, particularly the Portuguese, uh, the Greek, the Persian, the Indian. Uh, even in terms of religion, there's a wide range of diversity with Islam, yep. Christianity, and all having footholds. And this, of course, is uh, the the best way of expressing, or at least uh, sort of explaining, the the impact of this civilization is looking at the architecture in the area looking at the culture, the diversity in terms of, uh, you know, language and uh, heritage. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think one of the first things that come to the mind of a person who is interested in the region or asking, is quite inquiring about the region, is the Swahili language. Yes. And, uh, now coming to the Swahili language, uh, it's Swahili language is a, it's part of the Bantu language. The Bantu language is, uh, is uh, the Bantu is a community that extends from uh, South Africa to almost part of Nigeria. But uh, yeah, actually, it, not to actually cut you short, because um, I've also kind of read some history, especially uh, 2000 BC. Um, the Bantu also an interest in um, Africans, so they they began expanding from the midwestern part of africa like you said nigeria cameroon that part and then they kept expanding up onto the coastal part and southern part of africa even up to madagascar so yeah uh the the swahili is also a a part of uh the, the the bantu languages but um one thing about the swahili is uh it's it's very mixed it's very mixed. So, um, is can we say can we say there are there are people specifically we call Swahili. So, if if we say there are people called Swahili, who are these people? The Swahili. 
Uh, well, uh, just to go back to what you said, I mean, the uh, Bantu is, the, the Swahilis are a majority Bantu people, but there are people who uh, are found uh, along the coast. And uh, that name is actually, uh, etymologically, is derived from the uh, Arabic word of Sahil. Sahil means, uh, Sahil means, uh, means coast, the coast. Okay. So when you say Sawahil, is actually the plural form of saying Sahil. And when you you add that I in the end, you say Sawahili, it implies the, the you know, uh, what you call, in Arabic you call Nisbi. If people, when people know, for example, you know of Bukhari, Bukhari is yes. a place, the someone place is from Bukhara. Bukhara. Right, yeah. you say, when you say Bukhari, is someone from Bukhara. So the Arabs used to call these people Sawahili because they, uh, they live along the coast. So it was a way of actually identifying them as a little bit but, uh, 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 different from those in uh, uh, Bantu communities of the interior. I see. And you you have to also know that um, Arabs mainly came to East Africa because of trade, and some of them came because of political instabilities in their own countries. You know about the struggles between uh, sultanates, khilafats, and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. they used to come there to seek refuge or to 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 you know as political refugees some of them used to run from famines and droughts and uh some of them uh, like the omanis actually they had internal feud uh, brothers were fighting over over the thrones and then uh, one was pushed away and kind of uh, found found uh, himself um, in zanzibar and you know these parts of the of the of the region so they used to call these people Sawahili because they are found there, but their these people are majorly they are Bantus, especially I think from what I've observed, uh, they share a lot in common with what we call the Mijikenda, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, in what historians normally call them the Eastern Bantus. So okay. no, uh, not Eastern Bantus, the Coastal Bantus. So coastal. the Coastal Bantus involve uh, Mijikenda, Pokomo. These are people in Kenya. For those in Tanzania, maybe you could talk about. Wanyamwezi, I'm not sure really much about, about Tanzania, but all of these people, they actually their own Bantu language has its own uh, dialects and uh, different, uh, they, have, they have some differences among themselves. But then uh, for the purpose of trade and, uh, and communication, the interaction with Arab meant that a sort of uh, what we call a lingua franca. Yep. A language that is a little bit uh, manageable by everyone. It's, for trade, it's right? For trade, yes, especially even inside into the interior. Uh, and uh, Arabs' uh, interaction with those people did not only uh, end up with trade. You have to understand that those who came were mainly men. They didn't took their wives alongside them, so yeah. they had to, you know, when they they came to the coast, they they had they had to marry. Uh, they, so the inter- intermarriage also led to a new kind of. Um, what you call a um, new generation of mixed uh, people of mixed races. Yeah, that's uh, true. So if you go to to the coastal part of uh, East Africa, it's very common to see people who look like Brazilians or look like, you know, people of mixed race. And I think even in some parts of uh, West Africa where Portuguese had a great influence, you'll see such people who, yeah. uh, who f- have features of, you know, uh, afro asiatic features and uh, so uh, the with time of course uh, the lingua franca was, uh, which uh, i mean the swahili as a language was used to spread uh, it was used for trade but it also with time it was it became a language associated greatly with the with the religion the of islam right oh, with, with, the the religion, the religion. with the religion, with the religion okay. itself yeah so for anyone who used to profess uh, the, the Islamic religion, he had to learn uh, a great deal of Swahili. It's just like learning Arabic for many, for people in Persia and whatever. I see. So I the see. more sh- learning Swahili was actually associated with someone becoming a Muslim or at least interested in Islam. I see. And uh, with time, uh, towards the end of the 17th and beginning of 18th century, 19th century, when... Uh, British interest and even European interest uh, in the, the region increased. Uh, they used the same language. They translated the Bible into Swahili. Swahili. 
Yeah, because it's already it was already common. It was already a written language. You have to know that Swahili uh, used to be written over the centuries in using the Arabic script, just like the Urdu, Persian, Ottoman language and stuff. So uh, finding already a language that exists okay. was was easy for them. And the missionaries used, uh, the, I think, the 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 Swahili Bible uh, was translated at. Uh, many years ago, close to uh, maybe two centuries ago. Okay. So, yeah, for those reasons, Swahili occupies a very important uh, part in that area and also uh, in, in the history of Africa. And uh, uh, it is recognized, if I'm not wrong, as the most uh, widely spoken language in Africa after yeah. uh, English, uh, French, and Arabic. Actually, Swahili is the largest, most spoken indigenous African language. I think exactly. about a hundred million people actually speak Swahili, either for as a first language or as a second language. It's a very similar story to the Hausa language. Have you heard about the Hausa language? Yeah, of course, the great Hausa people. In, uh, in <laughs> so West yeah, uh, the Hausa language basically also um, it's kind of. Uh, turned into a trade language because when the Europe, uh, sorry, not the Europeans actually, when the Muslims, when the Arabs also came to the north part of Africa, they came into um, into civilization that had already existed, for, for like the Ghana Empire, the Wagadu Empire, the Soninke Empire. This, this, there's been long history in this region of empires. But when they came down towards Western and Sub-Saharan part of Africa, there were popular languages like Hausa, the Fulani. You've heard of the Fulani herders. And then, yeah. So uh, when they came there, they got mixed. And the Hausa and the Fulani mostly, I think almost 100% of Hausas now are Muslims. And they got mixed with the... Um, they, they needed to trade with the part of Africa. So that language itself became um, a mixture of, I think there is a percentage of uh, Hausa, uh, sorry, Arabic in Hausa. Even some people say Hausa is an Afro-Asiatic language too, just similar to Swahili. And um, sorry, I say Swahili. What's... Um, Somali, 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 yeah. Yeah, Very Somali. similar to Somali, how mm -hmm. they are. Yeah, so it's a very interesting part uh, of history. And it's very sad because we really do not know most part of the history unless uh, up until the 14th century when the Portuguese came in. Before that, it as if we, we never had history, right? So, for example, I'm going to go a little bit way back into way before the modern era. Um, when I was reading about the Bantus and their expansion, which I'm coming, uh, to eastern part of Africa, I don't know whether you know this, they met some people there, obviously. It wasn't inhabited. Uh, there were the Khoisan people, we, which we call them loosely Bushmen people. And I think in Tanzania, they also met people, they, what, were they Hadza? Hadza people. And this is very interesting to me because that part of Africa is now almost majority Bantu, right? And Khoisan people are down now in South Africa. These people had to escape. They had to escape that expansion of the Bantu people and then live isolated. And even until now, if you go to South Africa, you can see these kinds of people, they're living isolated. So it's a very interesting part of um, African history, which unfortunately we really don't know. But Swahili in general is a very interesting part because of the admixture, as you mentioned, right? And reading also, I saw that we do not necessarily call them Swahili, the, the language itself. Can you say something about the local people the local people there and what they see themselves as? Do they see themselves as Swahili? 
because I saw, I think, Waswahili or something, and I didn't really go into it. So can you ah. tell us about that? Well, first of all, um, the people who originally used to speak the language are the people of the coast. And okay. most of these people, uh, their interaction with Arab also ended up with marriage. So when you talk about the Swahili, according to me, it also has an ethnic dimension. But with time, because of trade, because of colonialism, because of um, uh, the expansion into the interior, the language became the language of everyone. So oh, right okay. now, uh, mostly the Swahilis, we identify themselves either uh, based on on uh, uh, cities. I see. Uh, so they either identify themselves based on cities or maybe... Uh, uh, we have also, for example, the Bajun. They 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 call themselves the Bajun, the Bajun, but they they speak the same language. We have Wagunya. They speak the same language. Uh, we have in Somalia uh, parts of the southern part of Somalia. Uh, they are spoken. Uh, people speak Swahili there. In I see. Uh, the city of Barawa, they they speak, they call the language Chimbalazi. Oh, the brava, the Bravanese, right? The Bravanese. The yeah, Bravan yeah. is um, uh, uh, a variation of Swahili language with uh, significant differences because uh, the Bravan is uh, the, the fact that they were in, they have been in Somalia, uh, they, they live in Somalia and uh, interacting with Somalis as well and interacting with also the Italian colonials, colonialists and uh, the likes. They have the, the language has developed as a different dialect. I see. But <laughs> normally, even uh, during the... Uh, 1991 uh, civil war in Somalia when the, the people of, from Somalia migrated into Kenya or I mean sought mm -hmm. refuge into Ken in Kenya the Barawas had only to take around two months to just try to adapt their own dialect to the new language yeah. Yeah. so they share every, almost everything it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, I think it's, uh, it's going to be wise to say that uh, for people who speak Spanish and, and Portuguese, they think they talk about a lot of uh, overlap in, in between yeah, languages. The maybe Iberian, the, the Iberian maybe. Peninsula, right? So yeah, that yeah. side of the world, yeah. Yeah. So the the the, the comparison could be could make sense. Uh, a little bit uh, strange in the Swahili community is Comoros. I think also the fact that their language is included as part of Swahili, but. Uh, they they have or they they I've I've tried I've met them and they they sound a little bit different and I think it's mostly it's mainly because of the impact of French uh, French as a language uh, and also because uh, despite them being Swahili they've been isolated from the mainland so uh, yeah. that might with time also uh, you know uh, have limited maybe a lot of interactions and exchange of words and stuff so when you talk about Swahili and was Swahili actually this is uh, it's not a uh, uh, when you, the the wa in uh, in 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 the in the, uh, the additional wa is actually in reference to the people. So when you okay. it's a Swahili way of uh, you know prefix of adding. You add uh, when I say, uh, uh, so example, Kenya is a country. So when I say Kenya with an M in the beginning, it means I'm someone from Kenya. So that so, mm, the, especially most Bantu languages have that. Yeah, yeah, Kenya, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so, so I say in Kenya, it means this person is a Kenyan, as it's a nationality. I see. Then if I say what Kenya, it means they are yeah, plural form. Plural. So, uh, okay. so if I say Mturuki, um, it means someone from Turkey. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Because they, they, we call the country Uturuki. I so see. when I say Mturuki, is someone from Turkey. So if I say Waturuki, it means... Uh, People Turkish Turkey, people. Turkish people. So I if see. you say um, Somali, someone from Somalia. If you say Wa Somali, it means interesting. What people. about Ki Ki Swahili, right? Well, how how does it make different? How how different does it make it? Ki is uh, the prefix for 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 languages. We use that for languages. Oh, so if I say okay. Swahili, is the the people or the area? Uh, we say Ki Swahili. Uh, it's the language. Uh, people from Barawa they use chi, and uh, oh, okay. so they say chi Swahili. Uh, I, and um, uh, if I say kituruki, it means I'm talking about the Turkish language. I see. Kihausa, 
Kiarabu, Kiarabu means Arabic. Mm. We say Kiingereza means Kizungu or Kiingereza means Can I ask you a question? Uh, in yes, Somalia, please. in the coastal part of Somalia, right? Is it Lam? No, no. The Kismanyu. Kismayo. Is, is it is it something like that? Is it also a Swahili word? Kismanyu? Yeah, Kismayo is a Swahili word, word, but it's a combination of two words. It's uh, Kisima means uh, the well, or where people go for to to you know to to get water from. Is that in Swahili? Yeah, it's a Swahili word. In oh, fact, okay. uh, it's a Bajuni word, and it's called Chisima, not Kisima. That's why if you look at Italian maps, the old Italian maps, they write Chis- Chismayo. They don't write Kismayo with K. Oh, they write okay. with with Chi, because that's how the Bajunis people in that area. The, the the people the call dialect. the Bajuni, the yeah, they're, they're part of the Swahili community. They have okay. small islands. They they own. They majorly live on fishing. So they 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 call the area Chisima, and U means up. So it signs is it's, 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 it's combi- when you combine them, it means the the the, the well that is up there. So okay. so Kisima is the is the. Mombasa dialect or Mvita dialect of of how of the of pronouncing it, uh, yeah, and then it goes on with time being called Kismayo. Uh, the real name of Brava, actually, I think Brava is a Portuguese word for something beautiful. Or like Bravo, is it? Bravo, yeah, something <laughs> beautiful. So it's not the real name. In fact, ah, okay. if you meet people from Brava area, they don't call themselves Baravanis. Oh. They call themselves uh, uh, people of Mwini. Uh, so hmm. Mwini is a, a Swahili dialect of, I mean, the Barwanese dialect of saying Mjini. Mjini M- Mji is a city or okay. a, a country. Uh, and then um, Mjini means people of, you know, they, they, it's, it's more of ownership. Okay. So Mwini is their own dialect. So uh, that's what they call themselves. If you see, they see each other in Turkey, they say, "Oh, you see that person is from Mini." They don't, but I the see. Somalis maybe because they they have mostly uh, got accustomed to the with the loan uh, word from uh, Portuguese Portuguese uh, uh, sailors who used to frequent the area in the fifteenth mm-hmm. sixteenth century. They they call the people Bravanese, and not only Somalis actually so uh, widely accepted, mostly as Bravanese. I so see. if you go to the UK, their community as seen as the the Bravanese. Community. The Bravanese, yeah, interesting. So they, have, they have accepted it actually, but then when they talk to themselves, and they uh, they Makes don't sense. they don't use that word. Makes sense. Makes sense. Mm. Yeah. So we we you've actually covered a lot. Uh, now you've talked about the coastal part, and you did talk about Comoros, um, th- those islands there. So, how different is, um, say, a Swahili from Zanzibar, or you know, those the Zanzibar archipelago, Zanzibar, mm-hmm. Pemba, mm-hmm. Mafia? Is it that? Is am I am I right? Yes. So that part of the the, the Swahilis in Zanzibar, the Swahilis in Mombasa. That's why even in northern part of Madagascar, I know there are Swahilis there mm. and mainland Swahilis. How different are they? I don't know how to ask the question specifically, but how mm. different are they? In terms of language or means of I think in terms of language, there are going to be similarities, right? Yeah. Because mm. the language is just different dialects, which is mixed mm. with. So, for example, if you go to Madagascar, the Malagasy people are probably the most diverse part of Africa because they are mixed with Micronesians, they are mixed with Far East, they are mixed with Bantus and other places of Africa. So I think when they did uh, a genetic um, statistics about Mad- Malagasy people, they were about just 70% African, Bantu African. So you can imagine how mixed that part of Africa is. So how w- say for example, would um, would a Swahili person or Waswahili would a Swahili or the oh, terminologies okay. anyways, <laughs> would a Swahili person in mainland Africa relate to a Swahili person in Comoros? Or how would they see this themselves as totally different people? Well, um, 
I think uh, they normally see themselves in terms of heritage. You have to understand that uh, these people were already independent uh, nations, kind of uh, okay. living in in particular areas. It's only the arrival of uh, in, in the new arrival of uh, a wave of Arab traders in particular that maybe has led to the intermarriage or uh, has led to this uh, the, the, the the expansion of the lingua franca. Uh, I see. And of course, the the emergence of Swahili as a very strong language, it 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 became the first language of some people, and to some people, it became the second language. For those who, uh, 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 for those who who of whom the Swahili became the first language, uh, there are those who uh, uh, Arab uh, heritage comes from the same area. For example, uh, tribes from Yemeni, especially Hadramut. Uh, area of of the of of uh, I think, uh, which is part of Yemen, they they might have the same members of the family settling in Lamu and then going down to Zanzibar and so you find these people will be our relatives. But okay. in general, I think uh, they uh, despite besides sharing a lot of uh, I mean common culture, common language and stuff, they are not uh, they they don't have this uh, blood relations. So. Mm. Uh, you have to also uh, uh, know that the 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 closer they are geographical to each other, the the, the, more, similar the, the more similar they are. So, yeah. with the case of uh, Barawa, you see, uh, Barawa is at the is it's the farthest in the north in terms of the, the uh, city that speaks Swahili. Swahili, so, yeah. Yeah. So they. They they find it difficult to understand uh, their compatriots, for example, in Mombasa, hmm. at the first instance. But they understand them. Uh, each they they understand the Bant- the Bajunis in Kismayo much easier. Okay. Uh, in fact, um, they 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 can communicate uh, independently I and see. understand at least eighty percent of each other of, of each other's language. For the Swahili uh, in Mombasa, he will understand a lot of the words but connecting them might be a little bit difficult uh, so that's that's what happened and also you have to understand uh, uh, the impact of uh, for example Arabic language in Barawa can be more than it it has been in other parts of, of, of the country and vice versa so if you look at the Swahili and the coast there uh, they've interacted with the Portuguese so they have a lot of Portuguese words Okay. Uh, if you just example, you can talk of bandera. Bandera in in Swahili and in Barawa lang- Barawa language means the flag. I see. These are things that maybe were common, uh, picked hmm. from the from the Portuguese sailors. I Meza. think maybe I think maybe the Swahili in Mozambique would be probably more Portuguese. I, I I'm just <laughs> thinking out loud here, but would it make sense? It will make sense because even right now, even the recent history tells us, like, if we talk, uh, I'm a Somali native, so if I speak Somali with the brothers from Djibouti, they will have uh, more some French f- more French words that I might not understand. So it just happened actually recently that one uh, Djibouti guy uh, I knew was sick, and then I called his phone. One of his family members picked up the phone and then was telling me the problem he had, but the, the terminology was using was, <laughs> was French yeah. terminology. If Very you go to people from South Somalia, they have had uh, a lo- uh, strong interaction with the Italian colonies. The only the language, the Italian language, was only abolished uh, in the beginning of 1970s. So um, a lot of um, uh, words that are used in football, that are used uh, for hardware that are used for even uh, curse words they are yeah. uh, they sometimes from italian, uh, italian. so people from uh, uh, the northern part of somalia hargeisa and others uh, they they find it uh, strange like what are these guys talking about so yeah, I see. yeah so it happens so in the same case with mozambique the fact that they are they are a colony of, Port- uh, of portugal um, they were a colony of portugal then it's it's very normal that they 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 share a lot of words, but actually it's not. Besides uh, besides our, uh, Portuguese, we have uh, Indian words in, in the Swahili culture. Okay, you, you can talk about uh, words like pesa, which means money, and uh, like and, in pesa, uh, the, the the app. 
the, the, the app used M-Pesa, to transfer yeah, money. Actually, M-Pesa. 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 M is money. Oh. Pesa. So they, 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 they made the money short and then Pesa is money. So the Pesa is actually money. And oh. it's, uh, if you watch in Bollywood sometimes, you'll hear those words. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the bulk uh, percentage of loan words come from Arabic. And this one also, uh, uh, from the books they tell you, maybe the loan words from Arabic can be ranging around 15%. But interesting. Uh, if I've met uh, the, the scholar who is who, who that passed away some years ago, he is from Lamu. So interior there, the concentration of Arabic words are is more. very much higher, very much okay. higher. Because you have to understand that uh, the the more a community is religious, even though. Yeah. The, the more the more Arabic words will appear in the yeah. in the process. If so, even if you come to Turkey, here people who like to identify themselves with the Ottoman heritage, you'll find that the Ottoman language had more Arabic words than it currently present in the Turkish language. Yeah. So, if you go to those areas, you might find the similarity being uh, uh, close to between thirty to forty percent. If I'm not interesting, wrong. interesting. And I, I prefer to actually assume that this is the case because if you look at the at the uh, days of the week, you could talk of uh, so. So when it starts from Monday, it's a little bit very local. Tuesday very local, Wednesday local, but when you when you go to to Thursday and Friday, uh, they are Arabic words. Arabic. So two out of seven in that case. Hmm. And for 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 the when you you try to uh, number from one to ten, you find that uh, number uh, number number six, seven, and nine are Arabic. They are Arabic. So I would like to assume this is just an indication that something around thirty percent is actually Swahili. But the the problem Very interesting. is, yeah, the problem is that uh, most of the Swahili was because. They sh- they they lack the some of the Arabic consonants. These words end up uh, kind of uh, uh, become very Swahilized in a, in a while that they even an Arabic person who doesn't know the language might not pick from the first. From Makes here. sense. Yeah, actually, the Swahilis, uh, for example, the, the, the uh, I don't know what is something general among the Bantus. The Swahilis don't have their words ending without a vowel, so something has to end with a vowel. Hmm. Something has to. I, I think that's. I think that's. That should be a Bantu thing. It should uh, be because Muslim. most most mainland African languages are. What do the lang- linguists call it? They, they they're sounds rather than. They, they're not as. They're very different. They're just sounds. Even way in Ghana. Uh, the local languages are more like sound based rather than the one we we're familiar with. You can you it's very difficult for you to find a language that does not end with a vowel. All of them, yeah. almost all of them, end yeah. with a vowel. It start they start almost all with consonants, and then end with vowels a or o or something like that. That is why African languages sound yeah. that way, like o a r, right? All yeah. of them. Yeah. So um, when you, when you talk about the mixture of Arabic and then the numbers and then the days of the week, for example, in Hausa language, all the days of the week are in Arabic. Oh, all of them, a hundred percent. You guys didn't, Monday, have, didn't didn't have days before, what? <laughs> <laughs> From Monday to Sunday. So, but it, it's 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 it sounds local, like um, yeah. Asibi. It's mm. Saturday. Mm. Lad, Yomul Ahad, right? Lad. Ah, I see. Um, Atani, Ithnain, right? Uh, Talata, which is when uh, Tuesday, I think, yeah. So, in Juma, everything, everything basically is. And, and one thing I noticed from this is uh, maybe some of them, uh, Lad, if, say, uh, if you tell me Lad, it's difficult for me to assume it's Arabic in the first instance. You see, exactly. Sander. The same thing happens uh, with with the Swahili, especially with with the with the words that contain ha, ha later or ain later it's or half late. 
Yeah. yeah because so, Africans, we don't have time to just adjust our tongue, our, the way we speak <laughs> to that kind of, you know, it, it's just naturally. Even that is why when Africans, we speak English, it's much more natural, right? We, we don't want to stress ourselves. To, <laughs> yeah, that's the joking side of things. But yeah. it's very interesting when you mentioned. And I was speaking with my friend, you know, Swale. I was speaking with him and then he was telling me that the Swahilis in Congo, they almost have or they are trying to do away with the Arabic words. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, the, the, the language is more banned to Swahili, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah more raw, you want to say. More raw, exactly, so, exactly. I mean... It makes sense, actually. I've I've uh, I've met some friends uh, from Congo who yeah. speak Swahili. It's actually not the whole Congo speaks Swahili. I think is it was it the eastern part of Congo. Yeah, yeah, the of eastern part. Proximity. The, the southeastern part of Congo. Yeah. What I don't know is I don't know whether they are doing this intentionally, but I think um, from uh, based on the uh, geographical geographical location, their geographical location. They are very far away from the coast, and yes. uh, it is natural that they will have less Arabic words because uh, Arabs were not really much interested in moving into the interior uh, as they mm -hmm. were in the present in the coast. So uh, they mostly had middlemen who would uh, would go on their behalf to those areas, or or uh, they'll have occasional. Uh, you no, know, uh, I think it it was mainly because of the dangers they were associated with uh, a foreign man entering into the interior. The interior. It's always uh, the same. Even yeah. the health, the health uh, challenges and, and even may the lack of, uh, for example, maybe, uh, uh, the need sometimes. So when you I have the, the, the people from the interior bringing you product to the cost, you find no reason for you to go risk your, your hmm. life. So it, with time, I think, uh, the Congo is why they speak Swahili. Uh, and uh, to prove what Brother Saleh said, actually, is to when they when they count. So when you when they count, uh, they use a different way of counting that tries to actually over over overcome the Arabic influence. I so see. when they say when they say kumi kumi means uh, ten, ten in Swahili, yeah. but when you go to count uh, twenty in Swahili, you say shirini. It means Yashirin, yeah. which means Thelathin, Arubahin, and the way, uh, and it continues until you say Mia. I see. So for the, Cong for the Congolese, they don't say, they don't use it like that. They call you, they tell you Makumi Mawili, so two tens. That's so, actually oh, the, the two translation. Tens. So you say two tens, Makumi Matatu, three tens, three tens. Makumi Mainne, four tens, and you go. Uh, I see. So uh, I, 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 I met one friend, uh, Back when I came early here, actually, one of the best things about coming to Chuck is it has uh, uh, exposed us to uh, our lost brothers. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been able to meet our lost brothers. So, yeah, so I talked to one of them. He told me he speaks Swahili, but when he was explaining to me the numbers, he telling me to give him money. I, I, I could understand what he was saying because was saying when you say Makumi Mawili, it's definitely, uh, it's just saying like, uh, instead of telling you take this twenty, I tell you take these two, two tens. Two tens. So, um, I I could easily capture what he wanted to say, but I found it I found it strange that he doesn't know the Arabic versions of these things. <laughs> so I don't Very think it's intentional actually, unless there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a nationalist way. There's of a movement. Trying. There's a yeah. movement to de-Arabize Swahili. Maybe. Yeah. Very yeah, interesting. Very there interesting. There, so, is, there is, for example, in Somali language, there are attempts. Yeah. Really? There are attempts to de-Arabize. Oh, I uh, never know, knew that. To de-Arabize. I never knew that. It's um, interesting. Of course, people have different opinions on, on these issues. Some think um, the Arab words should stay as they are, but some people think like uh some arabic words are, are, are not necessary because already there is you have you have, they have the yeah, somali the, the, word the, of it the, 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 Solom, the somali word of it is already there but with time the being popularizing the arabic word means uh the, the somali word will continue to disappear so 
it's it's very the, similar to Turkish Turkish too because that um, after after the um, after 1923 right yeah. there was an active movement of actually having a specifically Turkic language and we know for example you and I would know the inkilab right and then mm. the, 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 that that kind of movement totally even making dictionaries and stuff like that so i think it's a very natural thing for people especially with history yes. to do yeah yeah some people they will tell you it's not because we hate arabic it's just we, that we want to preserve the original words for example right now if you talk to people from the north so from north somalia they will tell you when you ask when they want to speak of, of the of the of the uh, salt they tell you give me milk it's a mm, salt, yeah. so the the fact that this word uh it's commonly used in 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 the south in its somali version uh makes some uh, linguistics wonder why is this uh word popular in the north with the arabic later of it I see. So if you I talk see. about the spoon, the spoon has its um, it has its Somali word, okay. but you see that in that area, uh, though most of the Somali uh, poets and uh, linguistics come from that area actually, but then there is uh, I think the geographical proximity, the tr- uh, extensive trade with the with the Arabian Peninsula, they actually take words that they do not actually need. Because mm. uh, I, I do understand sometimes, for example, if as a person, I haven't been writing before, I don't yeah. know what a pen is. So if you tell me, Kalamu, or this mm-hmm. is Kalam, and then I call it in Swahili Kalamu, I will accept it. I think because maybe it wasn't part of my heritage before. I uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether, whether I'm accurate in this, but I'm just to give an example. So if, um, if I come uh, from a desert, and uh it hardly gets cold so i don't know what this um uh what, what a jacket is for example or uh, uh you know i don't use a jacket in my where yeah. i come from so if i if someone comes with a jacket and asks me what do you call this in your kind of language i tell him i don't know so he tells me that this we call it jacket so the i will jacket. take it in somali i will continue calling it jacket hmm. this makes sense to me but when um when it's something that is indigenously available. It's not. Um, I also I also kindly support that uh, you should not give it a different word when you already have it. But if you are taking it, then take it because you actually you need uh, to take need it. it. It's just like computer, right? Um, so, yes. for example, I'd I'd say computer is not indigenous to Africans. I'm yeah. talking about the physical PC computer. Obviously, yeah. the word itself is a totally different thing. So yeah. most Africans would say mobile phone or phone yeah. or yeah. computer, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't say most Africans, mo- most languages would say that, mm-hmm. right? Even in Turkish, um, they, they still call it telephone, right? And it's not a Turkish word. So until they find, say, maybe a Turkish word for it, maybe they'll still be calling it telephone. Anyways, we digress. Um, and so my question is, would, uh, would um, so the, you said the northern part of, or the most northern part of Swahili people are the brother, the brother, right? The, yeah, the Bravanese. The, the, the Bravanese. Yeah. Would, if a Bravanese, would a Bravanese call, say, a Swahili in Comoros, which is probably the southern part, how, how would they, would they see themselves as the same people? Or... The Bravanese the, and who? The, a Bravanese. Well, so I'm talking about someone in Somali, a Swahili in Somali, mm. and then a Swahili in um, Comoros. The yeah. Comoros Island. Um, because of the proximity, it's really, really far, right? Mm. So, would how similar would they find themselves? How similar? Would, so, basically, would the Bravanese find more similarities with the Somali than the Comoros? Do you, do you get my question? Yeah, actually, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a very important question to ask. You have to understand that... Uh, uh, well, these are loyalties, and uh, I think uh, with the formation of the modern state, uh, people uh, prefer to have their loyalties to the 
to the existing uh, national boundaries. I see. Now, uh, just uh, in the 19th century, these parts were most of them under the, the Sultanate of Oman. They were controlled from Zanzibar because the, the capital was moved from the uh, Sultanate of Oman from Muscat to see. Zanzibar. And all of these parts were under the same rule. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but the arrival of the colonialists and uh, Italians, the British and, and the rest, it meant that these, these, uh, the, 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 these lands were separated. People were separated from their, from their, uh, 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 maybe a, a, a kings. Mm-hmm. And it happened across Africa in many countries. You it see houses are divided, I think, in almost eight countries. Yes. The Somalis are divided into almost four countries as well. And uh, uh, these uh, demarcations uh, did not take into consideration the, the impact this will have to people and families and the rest. I so uh, the, uh, for, for, for the people of Barawanese, they're a little bit up there, but maybe this question will be more applicable to people of Kismayo and Raskamboni. Hmm. They, 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 they are very close to, to Lamu and Pate and Manda. These are areas that people have the same heritage, the same language, uh, they, they have kinship. And uh, uh, the fish, fish, uh, the fishermen will actually uh, move from uh, Lamu and come fish in Raskamboni, in Somalia, and vice versa. I see. So uh, determining actually their loyalties uh, is a little bit different, but uh, it's a little bit difficult. But I think for the Barawa people, they have had um, a very uh, uh, strong presence in the, especially in the in the in the during the colonial times and even uh, the the first few years that followed independence, I where bec- uh, the democratic you know Somalia was uh, uh, <clears throat> the first African democracy. I yeah. mean, it is where the first African country was able to transfer power peacefully without uh, a coup and stuff. So uh, during this area, this, during this era, Somali minorities who uh, majorly in the coast, even along uh, in the interior, will, were, it was very common to see them occupying uh, um, you know important government uh, positions, and uh, I think. Uh, in the end, uh, they also the fact that their dialect is not hundred percent or very much close to those people in uh, in, in 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 Mombasa and the areas, uh, they might be living a little bit of an identity crisis. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, I, I think uh, through my interaction with them, they 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 feel a stronger bond with Somalia. Uh, see. You see that in the way they translate even the national anthem to to their dialect. Hmm. Uh, they have their own radio s- stations. Uh, they are active in politics. They have produced uh, some of the country's best doctors, best ambassadors, and, uh, and the rest. And uh, it's where they 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 they, they feel that they are home. Uh, for the Bajunis, uh, their impact is a little bit, you know, uh, limited. And this is because of, uh, you know, they, they, they are my, they are, they are small number and many other stuff. And even these things were, were got, they worsened with, with time after the, the civil war. But uh, nonetheless, uh, their, their, their presence is, uh, even if it's limited, it's still present. And, uh, and uh, in the end, you know, there's one problem uh, that uh, uh, these borders bring. Sometimes, even if you make a mistake and you think that uh, those your kinsmen in other, on the other side of the border will be helpful, yeah. When you grow into that system, <laughs> you might be told like you come from Somalia, man, or you come from Kenya, or you come. So, so in the end, um, uh, the reality is that the borders exist, and I think people also kind of accept that. Accept it. Uh, they I try see. to find their rights where they're actually recognized uh, by I the see. state as citizens and uh, and uh, as uh, as uh, indigenous communities in the area. Interesting. So, uh, is it safe to say that? Um, 
it's almost impossible. Say, for example, if we were going to categorize or we're going to give countries to every ethnic and language group in Africa, Swahilis wouldn't have one country. It's because from from what you explained, Swahili should not necessarily be um, con connected to one ethnic group, right? So, for example, what I'm trying to say here is, if um, a man, the, the ethnic, the features, and then the um, the culture of a mainland African uh, Swahili in Congo would be more African, so to speak, right? And a Swahili in the coastal part will be the mixture of this African, Indian, right? right? Am, I, am I right in saying that? Indian yeah, and all you. these. It's, it's not very, it's not similar to, for example, Hausa, right? It's not, it's not the same 100%. Because I'd say the hundred percent house of people or the house of people have almost the number one probably the same people, and then the language and then the dialect isn't as diverse. I'd, I'd imagine isn't as mm. diverse as compared to the Swahili, and it's very interesting to me because um, recently there has been. There has been this movement of making Swahili one, uh, like you mentioned, lingua franca, even mm -hmm. in countries where uh, originally do not speak Swahili. Mm -hmm. uh, have you have you heard of anything like that? Have you seen this this movement hap uh, start? Yeah, yeah. I think actually uh, one of the people who pioneered this idea was uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Yeah, Kwame Nkrumah pioneered this so, idea. So the idea is not, the, the issue is actually, uh, I don't know about how this Hausa language is formed, but uh, I, it is uh, widely assumed that the Swahili language is easily comprehensible. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also the, the difference in dialects, uh, for those who maybe their dialects are a little bit very diverse mm -hmm. from the mainstream Swahili, it's uh, mainly the, 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 the Comoros people and, uh, hmm. and uh, the Barawanese people. So these are uh, periphery countries, uh, areas. And even um, uh, normally, uh, their percentage is not uh, enough uh, to, to, if you compare to, uh, to the, imagine the whole ton of Tanzania or a population of 60 million speaking Swahili okay. in a standard manner. And uh, maybe I think almost 40% uh, of Ugandans speak the, 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 the Swahili language. In mm -hmm. particular, the security personnel, it's mandatory for them to speak I see. Swahili. I see. And uh, uh, Kenya, a country of uh, 50 million plus, uh, uh, most people and almost 90% of the people, uh, besides those uh, in the interior, maybe like in the, the, in the nomadic uh, places, they speak Swahili language, so it's uh, it has uh, this mainstream dialect that is common to everyone, with variations. With uh, in Tanzania, maybe they prefer some words, but these don't make um, uh, communication uh, difficult. So I, uh, I don't think it will be a difficult, uh, a, a big issue. If you talk about the Malawi so. people, they, they are very few compared to the general population of the Swahili speaking community. So it won't have a, a big impact. And uh, I think in South Africa, it's being taught right now as one of the languages. Yeah, uh, yeah, in, that's in true. Namibia, in Rwanda, uh, Rwanda and Burundi have a significant, I think, 20%, 10, mm. uh, 15% of the people already speak Swahili as a, as a first language, if I'm not wrong. But then uh, taking the, the uh, I mean, giving the, 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 lang the language more attention, making it more uh, official or even mandatory to some for students is uh, is one way of uh, of uh, achieving this it depends we can actually we don't need to have swahili for all the region we can at least yeah. have Hausa in the in west and uh, parts of no, Central yeah, Africa they, they and the swahili working, can go to the, to the east absolutely they're actually working on uh, something like that and it's amazing that people have actually now come to understand that we need something like that we need something very similar to that it does not necessarily mean you're going to have to 
uh, be a Swahili or you're going to have to be a Hausa or whatever, right? Because um, the way Africa is going, we need to have a very common relations with one another. And this is one huge step, I think. Man, so I really wanted to go deep into a lot of things, but um, because of time, we, do, we don't want to bore people. <laughs> I think no most people who listen to this are very excited about it. And I, w- I yeah. wanted to talk about the Shirazis. And then I, I, because when I came into this part of Africa and I was really researching it, I saw that there are a lot of things people need to know. For example, the Persian and the Oman. And the, so that, that would probably be another time. And we might have also to speak about the Horn of Africa. Somalia, Eritrea, and uh, how different and how similar they are. But uh, yeah, we would I'd, we'd talk about it later, maybe on another sure, episode. Sure. sure, definitely. I mean, um, uh, these are, uh, uh, speaking about East Africa is not something that can end in an hour. So, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. The Shirazis are from the Pasha, they, they, they still I've exist. Heard that. We have the Balushis. It's a Never Baluchistan. It's a, Baluchistan is a region uh, be, between. Uh, uh, you know, uh, but I think, yeah, with time we can uh, organize for another meeting. Absolutely, absolutely. I uh, really uh, enjoyed uh, being your host today, uh, your guest today, not Definitely, your host. man, anytime. So, and uh, hopefully we could have more conversations. And Definitely, stay I'd love, I'd love, I'd love that. Uh, thank you, man. Thank you for coming on the podcast and uh, wish you the best of luck in your endeavors and take care, man. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, Dafis. So, All right, bye-bye. So, okay. so, um. Thank you for listening to this episode of the African Experience Podcast. For show notes, visit us on www.theaexppodcast.com and follow us on social media at the AEXP Podcast.